Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mobile Marketing Association webinar series 2020. Thank you all for being here with us today. I hope everyone's staying well and still keeping safe wherever you are. Today's topic is um, decoding the gaming audience. Um, the gaming industry, as you all know, has come a long way since the retro gaming days of Atari, Sega, Nintendo. I mean, those born around my time would know. Of course, the younger ones may be still rather unaware. But, uh, you know, the gaming community is finally getting a serious um, look from mainstream media and brands altogether. With more than 1 billion tweets on gaming last year, uh, gaming Twitter has been thriving. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, even more people are tuning in to the gaming space uh, as a major source of comfort, uh, sometimes entertainment, and even social interaction. So today's session will be presented by our speaker, Martin Uren, Head of Research, Asia Pacific, Middle East, and North Africa Twitter. He will be sharing insights uh, from the new research on Twitter gaming audience. My name is Shanti Tulani, and I'm the country head of MMA Indonesia. I will be your host and moderator for today. Uh, before we begin our topic, allow me to share with you a little bit about Mobile Marketing Association. We are a not-for-profit global association headquartered out of New York. Uh, globally, we have over 800 plus members across 14 regional offices in 21 countries spread out across uh, the US, Latin America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. We're a new industry body that welcomes, as you can see, marketers, agencies, media, publishers, telcos, uh, technology providers, device manufacturers, basically every part of uh, the advertising and marketing ecosystem. So who are we? Why are we here? And what's our purpose? Uh, we truly believe that mobile is the next big thing and is the quickest way for chief marketers or brands to reach out to their consumers. And of course, during the COVID situation, we're experiencing uh, this kind of uh, you know, uh, emphasis on the mobile. So we primarily reach out uh, to the chief marketers and help them through this process. Um, we're here also you know, to push, uh, enhance, accelerate the transformation and innovation of marketing through uh, mobile. Our initiatives stand under these four main important pillars, as you can see on your screen. And, uh, you know, beneath these pillars are the activities that we run all year through. So such as um, these webina webinars that we are conducting, uh, the impact forums, Smarties Awards, workshops, training sessions, um, surveys, reports, research, white papers, even certification programs, and numerous case studies uh, that we have compiled onto our website. On our website, you will also uh, find all these other initiatives as part of MMA. Some of them are uh, work around measurement, attribution, cognition, and best practices around ad fraud, brand safety, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so many of these initiatives are actually done uh, on a global level with MMA Global, but we try to localize them into our uh, individual markets here locally. Um, our MMA theme is Shape the Future, and we are doing our best uh, to help get there along uh, with uh, you know, the experts from the industry that we work with uh, to bring about that change uh, in the digital era that we are uh, all in and hope to stay ahead of the curve too. Uh, with that, we are also trying our best, uh, you know, uh, for the industry during these tough times where COVID has hit us all globally. So, um, you know, each one of us are doing our best, uh, either taking, you know, individual efforts or collective efforts and responsibility uh, in trying to make a difference within our space. So MMA has also opened up a platform uh, with all the relevant information on COVID in this support hub. Uh, you can access this on the link provided below. And uh, yes, the hashtag is we are in it together because we truly are globally. So let's hope uh, that with all of this, we can get past the tough times really soon. Just a slight glimpse uh, and, an, and a slight glimpse to our upcoming webinars. Uh, here they are, as you can see on your screen. We started our webinar series early April. 2020. We will be conducting these all through uh, the next few months ahead of us. 
You may scan the barcode on the right side of your screen or even visit the website mentioned below. The presentation of today's presentation and of course all the other presentations uh, are included in these as well. Next Friday is a must attend uh, panel discussion with our managing director, Rohit Adwal, and some of the top industry experts. So stay in tune uh, for that. We are also looking very quickly, we are also looking at other initiatives outside of these webinar series. Um, there, there's the, the MMA CDP Mobile Marketing Certification Program. It is a two day online program for senior level managers. If you haven't registered yet, please do. Today is in fact uh, the last day for your registrations. Uh, on the other hand, we also have the MMA Ideathon 2020 concept, and this is a shout out to all developer communities who have, uh, who've joined us on this webinar to come forward and participate with us uh, and help solve business challenges for brands across Asia Pacific. And for all those brands out there attending this webinar, if you have any marketing challenge or business challenge and are looking for solutions across the region, uh, tech-based solutions, do contact us for your participation. Um, just a reminder, the MMA Smarty submissions are still open. So for all those campaigns that you have worked upon, it's time to submit them to us. Uh, we have a new COVID category as well. Uh, this is to help you know, provide recognition to all those brands that have contributed uh, to help uh, you know um, either you know the frontliners or communities at large so we look forward to your campaigns this year do reach out to us for any information that you need for the above lastly of course these are additional areas in which uh, we at MMA we are working on we collaborate with our members we build uh, subcommittees with our partners to work on different areas of these programs so, uh, you know, we'll be happy to have you join MMA and collaborate with us on new topics and new ideas. For today's webinar, uh, there will be a window open for you on the right hand side of your screen to pour in your questions. Please do so, add in your name, your title and the company that you represent. Uh, also, the country that you're based in, which will be important. And um, we'll try and address uh, all your questions at the end of the webinar in, this, in the Q&A session. But we also try to take a few in between when we are uh, you know, doing the interactive poll during this session. So please pour in your questions there. With this, let me once again introduce you to our presenter for today, Martin Uren, Head of Research, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North Africa. Twitch. Martin leads the team uh, responsible for developing and providing market insights into all aspects of Twitter from audience to global events. Previously, uh, Martin has spanned uh, media agencies, global publishers, research agencies, and international broadcasters based within London, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So thank you for being with us, Martin. And my name is Shanti Tulani. I'm the country manager of MMA Indonesia. Once again, I will be your host and moderator for today. So with this, I shall pass the control to you, Martin. Just give me a second. That's great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hold on. Mm. One second. Here you are, I'm making you the presenter. Okay. That's great. Thank you, thank you for this, uh, Shanti. Um, let me just make sure I can move on to the next one. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, what I'd like to do today is, and thanks for the opportunities, is to just share with you all um, some some of the insights that we've been looking into around gaming. As Shanti was mentioning, we're in a really unprecedented time where uh, not only are we facing global pandemic, we've faced other global pandemics and catastrophes before, but this one is very different because we are we are spending more time at home, we're spending more time in a confined um, arena, which has actually sort of led to a series of insights around different verticals that we've been looking into. Um, so the first one is we're looking into is around the gaming audience. Um, this isn't new for, for Twitter and it's not new for a lot of people. But what I think this is, is I think it's the opportunity to really show what gaming is all about and, and how much 
uh, how much gaming has developed into a true media channel. So hopefully today, I think what we'll be able to provide is some insight into what's happening within the conversation, a few ideas around potential future trends and development, but plus also I think for those people who haven't yet embraced the concept of branding or communicating via a gaming platform or to a gaming audience, hopefully we'll be able to, to demystify some of those elements for you. Before we start, just to, to warm you guys up, um, where the guys at the MMA are going to activate a quick poll for you all. Um, what do you think is the most talked about game so far in 2020? Animal Crossing, League of Legends, Mobile Legends, Fortnite, or PUBG? I'll give you a few seconds to answer. I'm not going to give any clues away. I'm just going to wait for another few seconds before I close the poll and launch the results. Go for it. <laughs> but this is interesting, though. This will be an interesting thing to. All right, I'm close <laughs> the poll. We have, uh, we have just a few more. All right, here we go. And let me share the results. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. So PUBG in first place, Animal Crossing. I mean, League of Legends, Mobile Legends, Fortnite, superb. Well, Stay tuned. Um, we'll, reveal, we'll reveal some answers as we go forward. Um, so yeah, just a, a little bit about me. Um, this is how our circuit breaker life is going. Please feel to either reach out to me on Twitter or, or, or follow me. I'm always very open to, to hearing people and answering questions. Um, yeah, we've been we've been sending our circuit breaker indoors, um, as it's called circuit breaker in Singapore. Uh, this is my little son. Uh, the plasters, I, I got some grief about this. The plasters were not caused by him peeling potatoes. They are completely there for, for dramatic effect. Um, so let's think about uh, gaming. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is just, as I, as I mentioned, share with you some, some insights into the gaming conversation, but plus also some uh, bespoke research that we've done into the community. Where do we start? Well, I think what is really interesting is that um, the majority of the world's population has sort of been going into lockdown. Um, and what we've seen is sort of no surprise is we've seen the rise of conversation around gaming. But what we've actually done is combine some research to look into the specific need states and to see specifically what is it that gaming can offer. Uh, you know, we've seen some amazing headlines, uh, people continuing their passions in sports and uh, in places like the, the Philippines where there was no basketball, um, a very, a very dated version of NBA uh, was downloaded very quickly, so people could people could get their fix of basketball. Uh, and we've actually seen people go on um, Animal Crossing's dates. Uh, so there's some really interesting times happening within the gaming audience. But what is really interesting is is given the fact that we are you know we are a group of people who want to be social, we want to get out and speak to other people, and we want to connect. Um, is the, the trend through connectivity through gaming, does this actually mean that post COVID, that gaming will be in a stronger position to offer more than potentially its biggest rival for television time, which is TV content? When we think about gaming, um, and there's a great point that Shanti made at the start is, we have to consider how long gaming has been present within the home. It's not unfeasible for us to think of the current generation as, as the first generation of gamers, but actually most of the gamers that we see today are probably second generation. And that's really interesting because that second generation will have less resistance to spending time playing games. I think we're all familiar with those situations where you know, the parent was always saying that you know gaming was a was seemed to be a, a sort of a waste of time i think you'll actually see some evidence later on as to how attitudes have really changed around this particular topic in fact if you're a member of uh, hamako mori uh, you might even be a fourth generation gamer or a fifth generation gamer because at 90 she was recognized as the oldest gamer in the world gaming has been present for the past four decades uh, and, and sort of evolving over time. What started with NES and Sega in the 90s has really sort of expanded and became portable in the 2000s and then accelerated. And, and the reason why it sort of accelerated post 2007 is because the iPhone was launched in 2007 and the higher portable processing power that it brought to the, to the market really was a, was a massive game changer. Gaming then started to take off in the app development 
Um, originally, there was no games available within the App Store, but that changed very quickly. And now the, you know, through those huge, um, those huge vertical industries around Angry Birds, Candy Crush, Pokemon, um, and now all the way through to one of my personal favorites, which is uh, Exploding Kittens. Um, but as we sort of move into the 2020s, we've seen COVID come along. And what COVID has done is it's really accelerated the gaming trend. So what we're saying is that gaming is not a new trend. Gaming has been around for a very long time. It's just that the current situation that we're in has really accelerated this. To provide some context, um, and people often talk about, or how big is gaming and how many people are gaming, um, we actually saw a stat which came from 2018, and I think this is the most significant moment in time, because all of a sudden what you found was the League of Legends World Championships drive in an audience of 100 million people. Bearing in mind that the Super Bowl, the previous multi-million dollar generating ad-filled uh, global tournament, which is the Super Bowl, could only drive in 98 million people that year, we all of a sudden start to see a change happening dramatically. Another way to look at this, yeah, and especially if you're a fan of esports, is the growing amount of support individual players that get generating, not just generating, but plus also the prize pool. Now, for those people who are very super eagle-eyed, what you'll see here is not only Booga winning nearly $3 million in prize money, but he's actually doing this at 16 in the same arena that Novak Djokovic won a similar amount a few weeks ago. Novak Djokovic is twice the age. Why is it relevant to Twitter? What is it all about Twitter and gaming? Well, at Twitter, what you see is that the gaming audience has been coming to Twitter to discuss, find content, build on their passion. And this has actually meant that the audience that we have on our platform are 28% more likely to be involved in gaming than versus the, the online population. And as mentioned, APAC conversation has been rising. It's been steadily rising year after year. But what we've actually seen in APAC across the COVID period is a boost of around 55% year on year. So as people have started to move away from uh, television content series or those series have actually started to run out as they've gone into not, um, a blackout production mode, we've seen gaming come on board and really start to increase its presence within the conversation. When we put it all together, in April alone, we saw almost a quarter of a billion tweets across all of the APAC region. And that was coming from an amazing 103 million unique authors. So gaming has really become extremely widespread. So as we look into uh, gaming into 2020, we weren't really expecting this amount of disruption. But I think it's what's I think what's really interesting is is what have we learned about gaming and its role within society as we started to go through this period? Well, the first thing is is you can't get away from the presence of Animal Crossings. Animal Crossing, which was a game that was reinvented, it's a very historic game, has really dominated the conversation, and it's with 16.7 million tweets, is one of the most talked about games. Um, in fact, the whole Animal Crossings community is very evident on Twitter. What we see is we see people coming online, they're using this as a way to connect, they're using this as a way to really live some sort of normality to their lives, and we'll build on this in a bit. What we also see is the increase in the number of people that are saying that they're gaming to stay connected to their friends, especially amongst the Gen Z audience within Southeast Asia, but also Asia Pacific as a wide. Of course, people come on, on to play games to, to, to enjoy themselves or to use up free time. But the fact that they're actually stating that connecting to friends is actually significant. Just to sort of spend a little more time on the phenomenon that is Animal Crossing. Um, what has we seen is, is that there's a considerable amount of people tweeting not only about the game itself, but also some of the more unique elements. For example, this was a live stream of the musicians that came. For those people who play this game, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a very melodic tune that happens within the background. The orchestra that put that tune together got together and did a live broadcast. Also at Twitter, this is something that we also see our employees getting a hold of. Um, DJ is someone who works within the research team. He's based out of San Francisco. 
uh, he took it upon himself to develop his own Twitter merchandise. Um, and he's walking around visiting other islands and staying on his own with his, uh, proudly supporting his, his Twitter cap and t-shirt that he's made himself. Another huge game that we see come along the horizon was Fortnite. Fortnite, what they did, which was amazing, was they developed uh, a system called Party Royale. Party Royale was normally everybody dives in on the island, finds different weapons, and they go around eliminating each other. Party Royale was the opposite. They had Steve Aoki, Kamen, and Dead Mal. They did these live DJ sets, and we had 1.1 million viewers on Twitter, including myself. Um, before you used to go and pick up weapons, and now you actually go off and uh, here I am using some V-Bucks uh, to, to buy some glow sticks uh, before I dropped into the party. So now what I'd like to do is really, I, I, like I say, I think I've given you a few headlines as to what's happening within the, the overall gaming conversation. But now let's think about the audience much more. And let's think about how do we start to uh, look into the audience and what is it that we can do to give you guys some insight especially as in the form of advertisers or branding experts. But before we do that, just let's get a feel as to who, what type of gamer are you? Because I think it's very important that we're inclusive when we talk about gaming, that we talk about everybody, that we talk about those people who are mobile, those people who use the PC, console, or those people who at the moment wouldn't class themselves as a gamer. So let's take a quick poll right now. Martin, I loved uh, what you what you presented and such interesting, uh, you know, innovations. I mean, I, I think I'm born in the wrong generation. I should have been born a bit later. But um, I'm curious to know, actually, when you talk about, you know, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, um, how and where are we placed amidst the global gaming scenario? You know, are we more integrated with the West in this space or... Uh, I don't know. I mean, how how are we in the shared space of gaming when it comes to uh, global the global scene and Asia Pacific per se? Yeah, that's, that's a that's a great question. Actually, and I think the gaming is one of these one of these industries because of its relevancy, um, because of sometimes of its low price point of entry. Um, it's actually really interesting that Southeast Asia is driving very much like what we've just seen in the results here. It's very much the hotspot. <laughs> Uh, it's very much the hotspot for the mobile gaming industry. So we actually, we see a lot of developers within this space and those developers are, are making games which are, are scaling not only within Southeast Asia, but they're going to a global, they're going to a global market as well. Um, so what I think is amazing is what could actually be seen as a constraint that people within Southeast Asia within some of the developing economies couldn't perhaps uh, afford the disposable income to make the PlayStation 4 purchases, but the way that the smartphone has developed, what I think is really amazing is that Southeast Asia and especially, or Asia Pacific, but within that Southeast Asia, has really driven the amount of mobile gaming technology. We also mm. see some, some huge significant changes. Uh, if you think about within India, the, the free public Wi-Fi at all of the train stations that's, that's being developed. Um, alone, I think I'm right in saying that there's about a million people who just work within those rail stations. So there's a million people that now have access to, to sort of free, fast speed broadband, which in theory, what you're doing is you're removing one of the other obstacles into getting into gaming, which is sometimes that people don't want to spend so much data uh, playing games. But with those barriers moving down and with technology increasing, I think this part of the world will, will just start to start to become a really dominant force within the gaming industry. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. All right, so you saw the results. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, so let me just sort of refocus again, like on about the, the gaming audience and, and what makes them so unique. Um, what we also see is that the, the gaming audience are also one of our most mobile audience in terms of taking action on Twitter so liking, following, following accounts, but they're also so hungry to see information as well. So this is one of the areas where we see some really sort of interesting sort of urge. And, and again, it's, very, it's a very high benchmark that they're looking to have fulfilled. Plus also, um, somewhat due to their profile being uh, uh, slightly younger, a little bit more uh, millennial and Gen Z, 
but they're also highly active on Twitter. They're, the vast majority of them are coming on the platform multiple times a day. So again, it's a great opportunity to reach this audience. And outside of, of, of uh, gaming brands, they're one of the most active in following all brands or following other brands. Um, and I think this is one of the inter interesting things. I think if you see what used to just be dominated by um, hardware and firmware providers sponsoring some of the esports teams, you then saw all of the energy drink people come on board. Um, and then you saw sort of mainstream tech with like uh, Hewlett Packard and Microsoft. But now you actually see more and more brands come along and they're sponsoring the big esports teams, or they're looking to get their they're using they're using advertising opportunities within mobile based gaming to really reach out to this audience because they can see the opportunity. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand what particularly about this current period that we're in could be a game changer when it comes to, to the gaming audience and their attitude moving forward. We worked with a, an existing research partner of ours, which is called Circus Social, to really go through and start to bring a little bit more of a qualitative deep dive into this particular gaming audience. So in essence, how do we do this? Well, we're analyzing a large proportion of tweets but what we're not doing is we're not going through and just counting hashtags and keywords. We're starting to analyze and see what trends that we can, we can identify. We looked at tweets, we looked at 6 million tweets across January to April this year. And currently we've got conversation insights for Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, and India. And coming soon, we have Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, Saudi Arabia, and the US. So where do we begin? What is it that we're able to look into? Well, just to go back to my previous point, what we're going to focus on is the different need states that gaming can provide. There are four particular need states that will always be present. For example, achieving. These people that are looking to, to create something, they're looking to overcome a particular level. This is what you find when people are playing racing games or sports games, and they're looking to beat a new challenge. Why are they sort of, you know, why might they, they downspin a particular game? Well, they've either feel like they've completed it or it's sort of too, too much memory. These are some of the sort of the key, key points that we've seen. Then we have people who are using gaming for thrill seeking or for moments of unwinding, which is maybe like things like puzzle games, or they're just trying to drive some sort of excitement into what might actually be a little bit of, bit of boredom time around it. What we're interested in is three particular trends that we see very, uh, we see the conversation changing dramatically around during this COVID period, which was around socializing, normalizing, and idling. Uh, out of curiosity, Martin, sorry to yeah. just, uh, you know, That's put good. you in the middle here, but out of curiosity, of course, there's just a few things. Um, when you mentioned in your previous slide that, you know, gamers uh, somehow sort of uninstalled you to say either they get they're bored of the game or there's too much memory or they've just finished the the final level of the game uh which also means that gaming companies have to constantly think of something new something innovative and reinvent their their space um is this also the dynamics that you see between brands who engage with these gaming companies or these gaming platforms how's the dynamics there i mean is it also that, you know, uh, is it the same between, you know, the gaming companies and their audience? Is it also the same uh, proportionate to the gaming audience and the, the brands that work with them? Yes, I mean, I, I think there's actually a very good um, analogy between some of the, if you look at some of the games which have really lasted the test of time, I almost in a way I feel like there's a there's a very big correlation with some of the brands that have lasted the, the test of time as well. I mean, I think there's there's an expression around like form follows function. So so what exactly is it that the game is providing and how long is the lifespan for that game? Um, yeah. And then plus also, I think when when someone invents a particular theme of game, what you often see is you often see a lot of people rushing into that space. Now, some people will come into that space with a game that's actually improved. Um, and I think when you think about the, the sort of the the PUBG or the the knives out type environment where you see people come onto you know a multi room based game that was a, a relatively new function but it seemed to be incredibly popular um, so i think what people do is they're moving from 
they're moving through games through particular themes, but they're also looking for different elements that the, sort of have been brought on board. And I think brands, I think, and like I say, I think that's what we're trying to do is to bring insight into this audience. So when a brand is thinking about maybe this is a great place for my brand to coexist, or this is an audience that I want to bring along, I think understanding the mindset as well. So yeah, I, I feel there's a, a highly valuable audience, but they're also in a mindset where they they could be um, very difficult to, to to sort of churn into your market as well. So yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, so what, what we're going to look at today is we're going to really focalize, uh, we're, we're really going to sort of uh, focus on socializing and normalizing. Um, idling, which is I, I think a little bit obvious around this time that we're in where people have got restricted movements and we can't actually do so much. But socializing and normalizing is really, really interesting because socializing means that people, you know, we're confined within their homes. They're using gaming as a way to connect with their friends and family. And normalizing is really interesting as well. It's like, how can people use gaming to sort of express their normal lives and, and really have some sort of uh, normality as it would expect? So when we think about socializing, there's a bit of a scale here. Um, we see India and Thailand as examples of, of markets, um, and Malaysia just, just slightly behind, where we really do see a, a large proportion of the conversation drifting towards a, a socializing aspect, the, the ability to stay in contact with people, continue friendship groups, et cetera. A little bit less so in Singapore and Indonesia, but still a highly relevant uh, uh, growing category. Singapore. So let's just zoom into some of the markets. Um, these, are ex these are actual tweets. We've, we've hidden the names for, for privacy, but you'll see lots of examples like this. This, I think, is really interesting. Um, Animal Crossing's tweet, and it just sort of shows you you've got uh, couples who, who are separated through to COVID, so they're using things like Animal Crossings to come along and just sort of spend a really cute moment with each other. All those people who perhaps are going to have one of those awful uh, situations where their, their birthday is falling during the lockdown period. And so again, what we see is lots of tweets like this, people who are saying that they got together and people who to, to throw a virtual birthday party. Um, within Malaysia, I think what's really interesting is that as you sort of see through Malaysia, this lens has come out that, that the Malaysian community has provided a lot of um, a lot of interaction and people sharing. Uh, and we actually see, and I'll come into a little bit more detail about this later on, but we actually see a high level of women within Malaysia discussing, looking for social, looking for social orientated games. Um, actually, at the same time, almost complaining about the men in the household just sort of playing in a very insular state as well. Uh, Thailand, um, when it comes to people connecting across Thailand, esports has been one of the really the biggest driving factors. Uh, it's it's enabling socializing across extremely large groups of people. Uh, we've definitely seen, and also what we've done is we've seen the gaming community come together, and we'll show a few examples as to how they've used gaming to even raise funds for equipment within hospitals. India, um, what I thought was amazing about India is this amazing crossover between very traditional board games moving into the digital space with great speed. Uh, this, is a, this is a brilliant query and it's a brilliant tweet, and it really does sum up the, the viewpoints. Uh, now playing online Ludo with friends at night is the most happening thing in my life. This is a, an example, but there's really so many tweets which is around people using uh, the digital space as a way to, co to connect and sort of keep some of their life going. So now let's think about normalizing. So normalizing is really interesting because it has to do like two aspects. One aspect, which is how people use gaming to really escape from reality. You know, they just need a bit of break from their life. They want to go and maybe explore a new world, just really change something different versus uh, what we see within places like Malaysia and Singapore, where actually gaming has now almost become part of the normal routine and, and what they previously were doing in a non-digital space. They're using gaming as a way to express themselves. This is a very, very common type of tweet that you'll see in Singapore. Um, as people are sort of within the, the circuit breaker within Singapore, and there is some sort of change as to how people are starting to see gaming. You'll see so many of this type. 
if you look, we have a list of all of the things this person here is saying, I really can't understand boredom during circuit breaker. Like, do you not have all these things to do? And what's really interesting is under cleaning laundry, uh, binging TV shows, talking to friends online, gaming is now one of the activities. And actually, even around when we had public holidays within the circuit breaker, you saw people create like a checkerboard of activities to do during the holidays and gaming was on there. So it really is part of the everyday. Within Malaysia, what was really interesting was that, that gaming is providing a way for people to continue their routine. Again, we see sort of an amazing use of, of Animal Crossing. The first time, we, uh, the first tweet here, there's somebody talking about how uh, gaming is just really, you know, it's just such an easy part of the conversation. They've picked up a new book, played some games with their little brother, uh, some, more, some more video games, they've watched some videos. Um, and also what you saw is you see other tweets like this, for example, someone saying that they've opened Animal Crossing and they've just kind of enjoyed the outdoors because they can't. So really that type of behavior that's normalizing. Within Thailand, uh, gaming was actually promoted as a way to relieve stress during this pandemic. So it also, there was a report which was from the WHO, which was suggesting that playing games is a great way to take your mental care. This is a very strong conversation thread that we saw in Thailand. Uh, within Indonesia, so one of the interesting things with Indonesia is that when we've looked into this gaming conversation, we've really seen how the connectivity struggles that Indonesians face on an every day has really been exas exasperated across this period. We now have everybody within the home, everybody's trying to use the same broadband signal. Um, so we see actually a rise of offline games happening as well. So people are coming onto Twitter to talk about uh, the gaming community, but they might actually be using an offline game. Uh, there was one which we'll come on to later called Worm Zone, which was extremely popular. But what we see here is people talking about like their Sims family, um, you know, they're quite happy in this case. That they're, that they're living in sort of a bliss, blissful mind, mindlessness. Um, or other games, there was a very interesting game, which was like almost like a homemaker game, which again, I don't think, I don't think this would have been overtly popular outside of COVID lockdown time, but it just has taken on an opportunity for people to live a very sort of normal, uh, a normal existence. Within the Philippines, one of my favorite tweets I've seen, um, this lockdown has got to my fiance. I said to him, apparently there was a meteor shower tonight and he asked me whether this was in real life or on Animal Crossings. Um, so again, I think within the Philippines, what we've seen is some of the ultimate lines blurring between conversations about uh, fact and fiction. Oh, uh, one thing I was gonna say about with the Philippines was Minecraft was also, I mean, it's a Minecraft is a game that's lasted a complete generation. Um, it's actually also what we see is a lot of people coming together within Minecraft uh, within the Philippines. Um, within India, there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, one of the basic, you know, one of the most normal things that we can do, which is uh, to go out and meet people and to go on to dates. Uh, this is an amazing one. Uh, I won't read all of it, uh, but you can get the gist. Uh, there's someone who's been enjoying the fact that they don't have to meet in the physical space uh, to go on a, on, a, um, on a date. They can actually be much more like themselves, um, all factors included. Um, and again, you know, date ideas like so the people is uh, sort of swapping different ideas as to what we can do and gaming, of course, has sort of been part of this. But again, it really is a good way for two people who are separated to come together um, and sort of continue to have uh, some very sort of um, wholesome, wholesome fun together. So what I'd like to do now is just really go through. So when you when you know when you're all thinking about this audience and you're thinking about all these individual markets, what other insights can we give you which could help you uh, understand this audience and also reach them in terms of targeting? Um, like I mentioned before, within Indonesia, the data and the connectivity, gaming has really highlighted what the some of the structural issues that people within Indonesia really have. For example, this is the case where um, someone was mentioning that their brother only ever comes into the room when they're searching for signal to play PUBG. Um, people looking at uh, online games, which they can then, um, which they can then sort of move away from their laptop. Uh, let's just switch to to offline data. And what I think what is really interesting is the actual conversations about the offline games 
tended to be more female. We actually saw a 60-40, a rough 60-40 split in this, in this period. People talking about how they've lost their connections, etc. So I think this has really sort of exposed some of those pipeline issues that, that somewhere like Indonesia has. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I did actually go and have to, to, to find worm zones, and I do get it, it's actually a pretty addictive game. Um, but people were talking about like how you could play worm zones offline, um, and again, I think this is something that they really didn't look all the way, that they, they didn't think obviously that this was going to be such an issue, but it's, it's the lack of connectivity has really forced people into playing offline games as well. Um, I think it's really interesting, you'll see a lot of these types of comments, multi-generation people before i think they like i mentioned if you weren't a gamer you're looking at your children or you're looking at your your house and you're starting to you're starting to question well why are you spending so much time on gaming but really i think gaming is starting to expand across generations upwards as well um within india like i mentioned i think what we actually start to see is a lot of the barriers that we previously had multi-generation people playing games um, my mum was complaining uh, that I was playing PUBG all day, so instead of playing Ludo on a mobile, and she's now playing with her sisters. So like I was mentioning, you've got people within the household who are spreading this gaming into different activities. So if we start to see this activity continue post lockdown, I think what we'll actually start to see is more generations of gamers come online, but not necessarily the stereotype what you think is going to be like Gen, Gen Z and Gen X. Um, I'm just a little of of time and we obviously we can share all this information afterwards but please take the opportunity if you ever have a chance to go onto twitter and read through some of the gaming conversations and you'll see this replicated all the way through um, um there's I, I like this one a lot because it was basically it's the com it's the complete opposite of what we saw before where people perhaps who were um uh denouncing their children for spending all their time on, on games are actually quite happy because gaming is something that's keeping people at home. Um, within India, I thought what was really interesting uh, was the, the this board game digitization, uh, amazing concept. The game that was so enjoyed within the physical space has now sort of been brought into the digital space and the lines between it have been really bored. But uh, as this person pointed out, you can't just flip the board when you're when you're losing. Um, <laughs> And what I thought was interesting is I've come to the conclusion that I'm not built for online board games. I'm coming dangerously close to cutting off my friends who have crossed me in Ludo. So again, I think it's a really interesting concept that we see developing. Within Singapore, I think what was really interesting about Singapore is, is the lockdown or the circuit breaker uh, and gaming really did show the, the, the very sort of impulse and high purchasing power that Singapore had. We saw people who very quickly went out and they bought brand new games. Um, they just didn't do the research before. They just went out and bought a, a, a Switch. Um, and they really just sort of looking this to, to, to sort of fulfill. And they, they don't really have that purchasing concerns that other people might have. People spending a lot of money um, on uh, the games or, or, for example, here, spending $50 just to get through a game, so to buy, uh, buy new features. Within Thailand, I think what was amazing within Thailand is there was, a, there was an interesting trend around gamers and givers. And again, this was a great way that the community really got together to help people uh, and to support. And I love this aspect, which was uh, uh, play a part, but together. Um, so we saw different teams come on board. Um, sorry, just I jumped too quickly. The gamers and givers aspect was, was amazing, a great conversation. We saw people doing PUBG charity. Um, let me just go through to the translations for those people. But we also saw, and I mentioned before, Thailand was somewhere where there was a very significant cost barriers that existed before. But all of a sudden, I think what you see is some of the game producers realizing that this could be a great growth area for them and start to make some significant discounts. And people did really respond to this. And the conversation really drifted towards that. So I think combined with some flexibility from the game producers, plus with the audience able to, to see a higher value in buying some of these games, there was really sort of a significant change in mindset. 
Twitter was really this, part, this place where people came to for advice. We saw a lot of conversations around people uh, looking for games advice and, su and suggestions all the way through. I'll just flick through these last ones. Um, the Philippines, the Philippines is extremely mobile centric. I think almost in the way all of the conversation was driven around people swapping advice um, and, and really sort of changing how they talked about different online games. They were looking uh, looking for people to connect with. It was really a great way to sort of show how the community could, to, could, could develop. Um, also as well, what we saw here was that the, the use of Twitter to really enable people to, to connect, people are focusing on video games, was actually one of the things that we've only really ever seen in Japan, which was that people become so into gaming that they want almost a separate gaming feed. So we actually, what we started to see is people talk a lot about how they're starting a new Twitter account to really open themselves up and just so they can see gaming within a particular environment. Um, within Malaysia, um, there is still some resilience within Malaysia and we see this within the conversation to the role of gaming. Um, I think there are some sort of some barriers that still exist within the relationships, but it really has changed very much across this, this sort of short period of time. Um, there was this, to start with, there's a lot of people saying, you know, that all of the, that the males in the house were just on games all the time. Um, <laughs> guys won't text for 24 hours. You need to understand there are things to do like playing uh, Mobile Legends or PUBG. But what we actually see more recently is a little bit of change and, and, and uh, the female audience really coming into the conversation. Um, tweets like this one about, uh, you know, just sort of make some space, do something on your own. Uh, I think, sorry, I thought there was one more on the bottom of that, but just, we see actually a lot of these tweets. And there was actually a tweet, which was someone who was saying that they've got so much into gaming that now they understand uh, what it's all about. And they're actually gonna be looking uh, for, for more conversations with their, their connected their connected males within a family who they've never spoken to gaming about. Um, so just lastly, what I'd like to do is just, just really summarize what do we see as some of these key insights for targeting that we found. I think gaming has really exposed the difference in purchasing power, something like Singapore versus Thailand. Um, there was obvious barriers that gaming has, has, has changed. But what I thought was really interesting was when we looked at these different need states, because gaming can fulfill so many of these need states, even in places like Thailand that might be a little bit more resilient to the cost, the, the, the barriers have actually started to come down. Connectivity is, is, a, is, is a struggle in Indonesia and, and there is a huge desire to get involved within gaming. And at the moment, this is sort of driving people towards an offline gaming, organized, uh, offline gaming world. But I do feel like if the connectivity would be resolved, they would definitely come back. Um, Within Malaysia, what actually started off as, as a very sort of female focus has actually developed into uh, conversations within, within both sexes, but also within places like India, what we actually see is an acceptability and a very, you know, and a positive role as to what gaming can provide. Philippines, Thailand, India, extreme uh, examples of how people have used, um, uh, used gaming as a way to kind of really normalize their, their lives, be this through board games or be this through esports. So what happens next? Uh, well, for us, as I mentioned, uh, we do see this as a trend that happened before and that has been accelerated. So we are gonna be keeping an eye on this and we're gonna do some constant tracking. Um, we are also in a way, we're thinking about how is this interactivity gonna move forwards? When uh, television comes back and it can make its full hand again, what is going to be kept? What is going to be the elements? And do we see this interactivity with gaming as an advantage that will happen over, over TV? And lastly, I always sort of uh, encourage everybody to, to use Twitter. I often call it the world's largest focus group. It's a great way that if you're looking to understand this audience is that you can come on and you can just start to look through the, the conversation. Um, at Twitter, we have a huge range. Uh, like I say, we have a, a, a many different teams who can, can actually connect your brand into these worlds. If you're thinking, well, how do I get my brand into this, into this environment? Um, the great thing about Twitter being part of the conversation is there's a huge range of opportunities from IGN all the way through to, to the, the different uh, Call of Duty League, et cetera. Um, before I just move on to some of your questions, 
I just really want to take an example of, as to one of these in a little bit more detail. And this is something that we've worked on within the research team to really ascertain what was the, the sort of the true effect. Um, yes, it was a gaming brand, which was always it's a gaming platform, which was Xbox. But what it wanted to do was be part of the conversation rather than just to order the branding that you see at the, at the different arenas. So what was really amazing was, was game, they, they wanted to enjoy this, this moment, but they also wanted to be seen and have conversation with actual gamers. So what they were able to do was utilize a different range of Twitter, more conversational, more conversationally driven uh, platforms and opportunities from things like first views, promoted trends and auto replies. So again, not just being there to badge, but also wanting to be part of the conversation as well. Uh, and it was excellent. It achieved 30% across our different benchmarks. Uh, the overall sentiment was twice as twice as powerful and they actually generated a 20% a shift in share of voice. So it really was a great way. So like I said, that's a very, very quick example. And we do have a lot of commercial teams. So please feel free either to reach out to myself and I can connect you or come back to me, come back to another one of the team that you know in the future. And with that, that's it. And I'm too bad on time. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, uh, some it'd be great to answer some of your questions. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. Very, very interesting insights, especially on, you know, the difference between uh, uh, the markets and, um, and yes, being, uh, you know, uh, being in this space, I have to say recently, I'd also read uh, of how some of these gaming platforms are starting dating sites within them because there's so much <laughs> of interaction going on uh, between uh, boys and girls, you know. Um, Interestingly, I just wanted to also bring this up to you uh, while you were sharing some of your data. Actually, MMA Impact Forum Indonesia last year had uh, Pocket and also Giring Ganesha, you know, take on topics on gaming across Asia Pacific and particularly Indonesia. And uh, Pocket data mentioned that 65% of casual gamers are women, out of which, you know, 41% or something. Uh, are women who have kids between the age of one and 10. So now we're seeing this space also where, you know, uh, where young young women are interested in, in gaming and that becomes an opportunity again for brands to enter this space without any sort of uh, gender barriers. But does age become a, a barrier that way? Because, you know, there is a certain, of course, because of COVID, as you mentioned in your presentation, there are a lot of changes that take place, right? I, I have taken place or are taking place where, uh, you know, people even above, you know, 40, 50 are also getting into the gaming space. But does age become a barrier for brands to enter this uh, this space? I think, I, I think it's a, it's not a barrier in terms of usage. And it's not a barrier in terms of opportunity either. And I think, as you said precisely, we actually, um, there was a, a presentation that we were doing at a Twitter event in Indonesia, and we were trying to find a way to express how gaming is, is as female as it is male. And we just, we just paused and we just left on screen and we just said, women play games. And we said, look, we just want this to sink in because mm -hmm. the stereotype that you have in your head is it completely wrong because that stereotype is, is potentially driven by what you see um, through professional gamers, maybe at tournaments, even though there's a huge number of female professional ga uh, gamers. But I think when people think about what are the opportunities that's for me to find an audience for my brand, I actually think gaming is, is the hidden gem that you, could, that you could untap. And I do feel that because it's a game and you, know, you, may, be, you may be a more mature brand, you know, to discount the opportunities that gaming can provide, I think is, is really sort of selling the opportunity short. We've actually seen brands like SK2 as, an, as a prime example. SK2, a, a brand which has very traditionally been focused on television or even uh, print and outdoor, has actually now started to invest in gaming in it because they know that the female audience that they're targeting, it's, it's a place where they've come on board. And they know that this audience is also leaned in and they're engaged. And I think like you mentioned, um, there's definite genres of gaming that have supported different groups. Um, women do tend to enjoy puzzle games a little bit more at the moment, but they also tend to enjoy what we describe as like hyper casual games, games which are, have a, you know, you can play multiple, either multiple goes in a very short space of time, or if you do have a very short short window, you can pick up and play a game for maybe less than a minute or so. 
Yeah, okay. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. We have a question. Uh, this is uh, a question from Ed Sharp, uh, Track World Sports Melbourne. He's the executive director. His question is, why are brands not sponsoring esports e -sport events or competitions? I guess they are still, I mean, they are uh, sponsoring, but yes, there is still a challenge. So, uh, Martin, can you share with us why this is why this is the case and with the gain with the with the popularity that esports has what are the challenges that that we're facing still yeah I, I i think if i'm honest i think there are brands that are doing a lot and i think these brands are in this space every day but i think the that it's just not getting the same, I don't think it carries the same level of gravitas, even though it is from the data that we can see, is as effective as, as driving engagement, it's as effective as driving uh, long-term brand saliency. Um, so I, I find it really amazing that, that it isn't so sort of um, uh, well prescribed at the moment and, and sort of well sought after. I think, and, and, and what I find amazing is, is when I think about, uh, how how people will sponsor you know that they're very happy to to have a, an advertising boarding at manchester united or, or a small logo on the sleeve yet the gaming audience that are playing games like fifa are you know is, is extraordinarily large it's 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 in the same audience almost on an hourly basis and these also these games have other opportunities within the, the borders as well so I think what it actually takes is I think it takes two things. I think it takes a little bit more bravery amongst the the people within the the decision makers to maybe go and push push gaming, and I think that's that's a responsibility for everybody. But plus also I think there's there's an opportunity I think around um, people like yourselves and you know to to really run seminars to get gaming discussed in a in a different sense than just a, a simple uh, transactional basis i think that's that has been one of the problems that we've seen so far so i think those people who are sponsoring this i think everybody can do a lot more to to sort of shed light on this probably the the, the brands that have made this jump um they realize how successful that is so they don't really want to make too much noise because they don't want too much competition but yeah. i think if, if if you think about what was one of the biggest events on the planet one of the biggest events on the planet this year was supposed to be the the olympic games happening in tokyo now, all of a sudden, a lot of people that were looking to associate themselves with the, the, the Olympic Games, which is about leaning in, it's about being hyper engaged. Of mm -hmm. course, there is a there is a there's a similarity with with playing games and it may not add as much drama, but, you know, gaming is a leaned in environment. Um, and if it's an environment that you're using to interact with people, just think about the concepts as to where the consumer is. You know, they're not passive, they're highly engaged. Um, we've actually done a lot of neuro research that shows how much the brain is firing off long-term receptors. So, so like I say, I think so soon, I think it will be the question of, uh, of when can people get involved in gaming as opposed to some of the barriers. But I think it will just take, it'll take a little bit more time, but we, but this has been the, the ideal moment to accelerate the, the opportunity amongst gaming. Um, thank you for that. I will just be taking one more question because we are running a bit short of time. But the other questions, we will definitely take it on, send us an email and we'll get Martin to answer that. But just one last question, Martin, which is, which is actually uh, in connection with what you just mentioned. There's a question from Tyson Rodriguez where he where he's asking your opinion on uh, you know on, on on marketing towards two different types of gamers. Where we have on one side the hyper casual gamers, so to speak, and the other ones are the involved gamers. You know, the intensively involved gamers. So, what are the marketing tactics that you feel? Or what's your opinion on that? You know, as far as marketers are concerned, tapping into these two kind of gamers. I mean, I think there's so many parallels with other platforms. Um, you know, again, I think if you were to make the the if you were to look at, um, you know, even like a as a good example is how people maybe would even discuss television. You know, we we for years we've been easily using the terms like heavy, medium, light viewers. Um, you know, or, or to, to to describe people of, of different. Um, uh different sort of states of fandom and actually i feel that the the, the, the hyper casual gamers they 
they can be just as passionate about what they're leaning into than I think what you'll find with the evolved gamers. I think there is a certain group of people, and it's a little bit like those people who are, who, if you make the analogy with, with like soccer or basketball, who will be there and watching every single game, doing every single thing. You know, there's a very sort of heavy group, but there's also like that sort of lighter group that will watch, you know, frequently and occasionally. So I feel that we've, We've, we've sort of almost in a way, we've, we've put too many barriers around both groups. We've put too many barriers around the, the hyper casual group as being that they're not that interested or they're not that leaned in. And I think we've put too many barriers around the evolved gamers or the, you know, the, the, the highly engaged gamers. Um, and we've almost said that, oh, you know, that they're, they're, they're too preoccupied to sort of pay any attention. All of these people are consumers. And I think understanding their relationship that they have with their games on their particular levels is actually, if you, I think if you understand that, then I think there'll be more opportunities which will open up to yourself, your brands, your, your, your communication platforms. So yeah, the way which I would say is, is if you're struggling with identifying how to speak to the hyper, hyper casual versus people who are a little bit more involved, I'd actually look to see, well, what are the analogies that we can make within our current media portfolio that we can actually start to bring into this world? And I think that would actually start to make it um, a much easier process for people. All right. All right. We've come to thank you for that, Martin. Thank you for the questions. We have a few more very interesting ones, in fact, from Shashank Shah and some others, but we will uh, answer that on email. Um, thank you once again, everyone. Thank you for being here, for giving us your time. And I hope you have, uh, you know, key takeaways from today's session that you can implement. Um, and, and just a reminder that, you know, we have many more upcoming webinars on MMA. So do tune in. Uh, for all the next upcoming ones. Uh, till then, take care, stay safe, and uh, stay protected. And yes, see you, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.